in some of our most rural places. Uh, in contrast to their nearby neighbors served by providers who have not made the necessary investments, these places are experiencing positive economic development trends. <coughs> that's exciting to see. Community leaders in those places without broadband are seeking solutions to improving broadband in any way possible. There's a wide range of strategies and activities and roles for these communities. Our panel has some uh, quality and diverse advice for you on this topic. We had a great discussion at lunch, and I know that will carry over uh, to our session today. So please listen carefully as there's some extremely innovative approaches to community broadband investment. Please help me welcome Ari Fitzgerald, Hunter Newby, and Gregory Dunn. <coughs> Don't forget to submit your questions uh, via the app. Uh, Greg, why don't you get us started? Tell us about the work you're doing. Well, uh, the problem we all know is return on investment. It's a cruel calculation, but uh, the cost to deploy the network times the number of homes passed you know, per mile times the percentage of people who take it uh, with the takeout rate. So you end up, you, you, there is no rate of return. There's no positive ROI in these communities, so it's just not getting better. So the solution seems to me is ultimately or the solutions uh, are going to involve subsidy and they're going to involve new technology. So I, I'm, today I'm just going to talk about three pretty innovative ideas that are relatively new that I just want to share with you. Uh, an investor-owned utility, American Electric Power, uh, is going to build a SCADA system to serve southeastern Ohio. Uh, it's needed for smart grid, it's needed to hit all the substations, uh, a variety of sensors. Uh, they normally would deploy 12 or 24 fiber uh, to run that system. They have hit upon the idea of what if we put 144 or 288 fibers in this thousand mile fiber system that's going to snake through southeastern Ohio. And then what if uh, we have the rate base pay for it? Because it's only the incremental cost that you have to be concerned about. It, the, the main cost is the construction and putting it up. You just talked about the cost of the, the additional fiber. So it's very small relative to a new bill. Then you lease it in an open access situation, or lease it, IRU it, whatever method you use, to a carrier, companies that are in the business, ISPs. Uh, you take the money you made from the leasing and you pay back the rate base. It's a very strong idea. Uh, it will likely get thousands of miles of fiber built in place it wouldn't get. And it attacks this ROI thing because the companies that would be coming in and using it are getting it much cheaper than they normally would. And they're probably going to be connected back to data centers in central Ohio, which are large data centers. They'll buy their internet cheaper. I mean, it works on a lot of levels. Second idea is a Microsoft idea. Uh, they're currently working with a company I represent to deploy white spaces technology in Ohio. Uh, white spaces technology, uh, look at broadcast. Broadcast has wonderful spectrum. We all know, you know, the UK, it covers, you know, 45 miles, it, it penetrates houses. Uh, there's unused broadband, or excuse me, unused broadcast spectrum out there in the rural areas. There's quite a bit of it. So uh, Microsoft is setting up a database to track where there wouldn't be interference and what frequencies could be used. They're going to put smart devices on towers that have backhaul and they're going to provide uh, internet via this system. Uh, right now the FCC is in the process of approving it and the manufacturers are working on the equipment. So this is not fully baked yet, but they, they really think they're going to get something going by the end of this year uh, in Ohio. So that would be, that'd be a major improvement. The final idea I want to share is uh, uh, an idea. There's the autonomous and connected vehicles are coming, you know, fast and hard. I mean, they're they're coming along. They need to communicate with the traffic control devices and the sensors and each other, for that matter. Uh, in 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 north of Columbus, there's a 35 mile area that we put the fiber on the road. They're going to put uh, every 900 meters, but what essentially is a small cell tower. It is an expensive thing to do, so, but you're going to need it if you're going to run all these connected vehicles. You're also going to need it for the commercial applications that the people in the vehicles are going to need because they're probably going to be watching Netflix 
instead of driving a car. So, <laughs> so, so it, it, it really works. So the state of Ohio is, is, has looked at what Georgia has done. Georgia has issued an RFP to allow uh, fiber construction in the limited access right of way. Uh, and there, it's you know, essentially an effort to see what they can get back for it, whether it's money, whether it's fiber, uh, you know, how that would work. So uh, Ohio's looking at doing it. I know Pennsylvania is also looking at RFP in this. So that would be a way to get, again, a lot of fiber optics and a lot of cell into uh, more rural parts of, of the state. So those are three different ideas that I, uh, that I think uh, are gonna be, may work in the future. Thanks, Craig. Ari? Yeah, so, um, First of all, I want to um, thank um, ICF for inviting me to this, this conference. Uh, I'm going to learn a lot, I guess, uh, talking to you, and I've already learned a lot with some Greg. Um, I just want to talk about some uh, overarching principles for governments that are looking to attract broadband uh, to rural communities. The first principle I want to sort of mention is technology neutrality. Um, you know, um, in rural areas that are not very densely populated, it may not be possible, economically viable, to uh, deploy fiber to the home. It probably will not be. So you need to be thinking about alternative technologies like wireless, like satellite. Satellite, there are latency issues with satellite. Um, and I've never known a satellite, uh, anyone who's received satellite provision broadband would be happy with the service, but there will be new satellite networks um, um, <clears throat> operating in the not too distant future, and hopefully the latency, uh, they will be able to address some of the latency issues, um, and that I think will be a great tool for providing service to the most sparsely populated areas. Um, I also want to just another overarching um, principle, I think is for the local governments that are interested in, a, in attracting uh, broadband providers to really, or, or you know, who don't have it right now, um, to really focus on incentivizing private um, uh, participation. There are a lot of things that you can do as a local government to make it more attractive um, for someone to come in and provide uh, broadband in your community. Um, look at issues like um, franchise fees, rights of way, what are you charging for rights of way? Maybe you uh, decide not to charge for rights of way. Um, you know, streamlining the permitting process. Um, if you are considering making a municipal investment in infrastructure, perhaps you don't invest in becoming a retail provider of broadband, but you invest in middle mile facilities or, or facilities to critical infrastructure. Facilities and networks that, that then can be used, capacity that can be accessed on a non-discriminatory basis by private providers. Also, if you're a local government, you need to be entrepreneurial. You need to be entrepreneurial about, um, and, and creative about how to facilitate uh, broadband. There are a lot of um, federal programs that exist. Um, Greg talked about uh, TV white spaces. I'm very familiar with TV white spaces. Um, I've been working um, in that proceeding for, I guess, eight years now, and uh, it's really, it, it, in, in many rural areas, he mentioned there are going to be a lot of vacant TV channels. And as he said, the signals propagate very well in that band. Um, there will be, and it will be cheaper to provide broadband service using um, what they call the TV white spaces spectrum. Um, you may not get the same uh, throughput or capacity as you would with fiber, but in communities where there are no broadband, there, where broadband doesn't exist, it's better than nothing, right? So again, um, uh, and he is correct that Microsoft is working with uh, providers. What Microsoft hopes to do is to actually work with service providers. Microsoft is not going to be the service provider, but what they want to do is license their um, intellectual property, technology, to uh, parties that are interested in deploying um, TV white space technology to provide broadband. Um, I want to talk about federal programs. We all, uh, many of you know about the universal service funds that are made available, mainly subsidies made available to carriers to help them um, 
you know, that provide subsidies uh, to allow help carriers provide service in high cost areas. So you're talking about the Connect America Fund, which currently um, uh, subsidizes the provision of fixed broadband in our rural communities. There's something called the Mobility Fund that, subs that uh, it's, a, it's basically a, uh, an auction format uh, that um, auctions to the lowest bidder the right to be the monopoly provider in an area that doesn't already have mobile broadband service. Um, there are RUS, the Rural Utility Service programs, loans, grants, and loan guarantees that, that are available to um, finance the construction of networks. And then, uh, um, and, and the Congress just appropriated $600 million for that program. It's a program that's been around for many, many years. It's funded uh, many rural electric utilities, and many years ago they started subsidizing on the provision of basic telephone service, and now they're subsidizing through the program um, broadband. Uh, another uh, program that a lot of uh, school districts and libraries know about is called the E-Rate program. Um, the, and what's interesting about the, that program is that um, the federal government subsidizes anywhere between 20 and 90 percent of the cost of connecting schools and libraries to the internet. Many of you may not know that currently, under current rules, you can, uh, if you're a school district and you want to connect all of the schools in the district, uh, you can actually get money for construction of the network. Now, you have to apply for the funds, uh, and uh, you have to pay a portion. But if you are a poor rural district, school district, you can get up to 90% of the cost of the network construction paid for by the federal government. Once that fiber is in place, you can extend the network um, you know, uh, to facilitate uh, the provision of services to enterprises and you know, uh, 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 individual consumers. So, um, <clears throat> so you know, if you're a local government and you want to attract, I guess what I want to leave you with is, you know, I would, I would suggest that um, you want to provide, you, you only want to get into the business of providing retail broadband service as a last resort. You want to think about what incentives you can put in place to attract people, maybe not the big carriers, but people, entrepreneurs, um, that may be interested in providing um, rural broadband service. Uh, and you want to, if you're the CIO or the Chief Economic Development Officer of a particular mm -hmm. municipality, you want to be talking to the, your uh, the school district, the school superintendent, um, uh, to connect the schools can then be leveraged to provide uh, broadband service to the, the, the larger community. So I'll stop there. Okay. Thanks, Ari. I think a couple additional points on that, what communities can do is to help shorten the sales process for any new provider. So if you can sign up people that say, yes, I will take a broadband service, and hand that list to a prospective provider, that's a big cost saving for them. I think it's extraordinary. And then I would just go beyond your E-rate example to look at the money that's available for rural health care, rural public safety, and so on, and try and stack those programs on each other. Very, very good point. Uh, Hunter, uh, tell us about your approach. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, some of you heard me speak yesterday, so this might be a little bit of a repeat, but um, I'd like to thank uh, Lou and, and John and Robert for having me again. Um, I've been a juror on the ICF for 10 years, and I've read uh, all the applications, top seven. Um, and I'd just like to say that what I do in the network neutral real estate interconnection business um, to me is first foremost and paramount. And everything beyond that is not relevant from my perspective of analysis. So job creation, healthcare, smart city, IoT, applications, devices, whatever, it's all fantasy. If you don't have the physical layer sorted out properly uh, to scale, then you're building your house on beach sand and one day it will go away. And that's because the incumbent will just raise your prices and uh, take over your, uh, control your own destiny, basically. So this is the first year that I've actually seen 
in any of the applications uh, reference to a data center, which Westerville uh, had in theirs, and I applaud them for that. Um, it doesn't end with a, a data center, which by the way, I don't even like the words data center. I don't like the word broadband, it has no meaning. It changes state to state, town to town. Um, I stay away from those things. Uh, but the solution to this problem that I think many of you in this room here seek um, in terms of high speed, low cost, high quality access to the internet applications is actually not anything to do with broadband. And that's the problem. The problem isn't broadband. It's everything to do with real estate. It starts with a physical or neutral interconnection point, and then within that point, an internet exchange, which I can explain in great detail, but I won't bore you with presently. Um, internet exchanges have been around for over 20 years. They operate in pretty much every major city around the world, and every IP network with an ASN is connected to an internet exchange, more or more than one, um, everywhere. And that's the fundamental basis of the internet. So your town needs an internet exchange. First, it needs a professionally run, well-known, uh, well-maintained, marketed internet exchange. And it needs a home. That exchange has to be in a place. And that place is a building. And that's not this building. It's not the basement of a building. It's not somebody's closet. It's a proper building that's designed according to standards and specifications. And that it will be operated and maintained by professionals that know how to do that. That's what you're missing. If you have that, then that would attract competitive network operators, both fixed line and, and wireless mobile microwave. I do this today. This is what I've been doing for 20 years. Um, I buy carrier hotels, I build media rooms, I bring internet exchanges into them, and I've grown these things from ideas to hundreds, thousands of networks uh, on a single floor in a building. <coughs> Sold many of these, I'm a partner in several of these kinds of businesses. And, um, and again, I'll give props to ICF. I, uh, through the ICF, met uh, members of the Canadian consulate several years ago, which then led me to uh, the mayor of Moncton, New Brunswick, and the premier of the province of New Brunswick, and I started a company there called Fiber Center. I acquired the Atlantic Lottery headquarters, which they were vacating. Their land, three acres, and a building. It was the only suitable building in all of Moncton and I looked for quite some time um, to create a neutral meet point. And the reason why the building made sense is because Lotto already had fiber from Bell and Rogers and network connected to pretty much everything um, to, for their you know, lottery, their keynote, and stuff like that. So they had this very small fledgling data center, which I was able to use as my interconnection point. Um, there's a submarine cable that lands in Halifax, Nova Scotia, back hauls their Moncton, which is why I put the facility there. Uh, but through the contacts here at ICF, I was able to start that business, and it's working. So what I looked at from an international wholesale perspective regarding the submarine cable, what I actually learned was I created an access point, um, which I know how to do, and I brought wholesale internet service providers to Moncton, which no one in Moncton or in Brunswick actually thought was ever going to be possible. You see, they wanted to attract data centers, and they thought that meant like hyperscale, Google and whatever, and what they really need is... Uh, neutral interconnection first, and data centers come. Um, so I was able to help um, the largest insurance company in the Maritimes called Assumption Life, uh, which is a physical tenant of mine and my building there, uh, move in and get access to wholesale internet transit rates. They were, at the time, paying Bell Canada $30 a megabit, which to me is unbelievable. And I helped them get transit for a dollar. And they couldn't believe it. They didn't think it was the whole internet. They didn't think it was going to work. They thought it was only like a couple of websites. And, um, <laughs> and it turned out to be the whole internet. And it's faster. And they save a lot of money, so they bought more. And I thought about that for a while. And I said, hmm, I've never done a rural facility. I've only ever done New York, Chicago, LA, Atlanta, big cities in the US. So I decided to take that idea and infuse it into how do I create greenfield seeds that become carrier hotels. Um, so I created a new company, and that's what I'm doing now. And my first site is in North Liberty, Iowa. And it will be deployed in operational October. And speaking of E-rate, Ari, um, I work with a group called Connected Nation, 
uh, two guys out of Kentucky sort of run that. They're down in D.C. They know all there is to know about E-Rate. Um, but yet, <laughs> they've never seen a carrier hotel or been in a media room. And they're running a nonprofit that advocates for broadband for K-12 and rural. So I invited them to New York and I gave them a tour of my building here at 325 Hudson Street. And uh, we've been working together closely since then. They were uh, hired by the state of Iowa to fix the broadband problem in the state. And this is in parallel to when I was introduced to them and getting to know them. So what I did was, and this, this is specifically relevant to E-Rate. I love all these programs and stuff, but they're very misguided and unfounded if they don't have this physical layer interconnection point as a component of the network architecture. I helped them write the RFP for 15 school districts between Cedar Rapids and Iowa City. It's called the Grant Wood AEA, or Area Education Agency. Um, I think I said that right. Anyways, um, I was able to secure for them by changing the way that one of the service designations, um, which I was referring to, that gets subsidized by the federal government, is called WAN access. And in my world, we'd call that transport. Um, and then the other service is called transit, which we would call transit. And WAN access for school districts is circuits that they would bid out um, between buildings on their campus in the district. So for elementary school, middle school, middle school, high school, that sort of thing. So I asked a simple question. Is it possible to bid out a WAN access circuit between an A and a Z where the Z is not one of your buildings, but just a different building? And they said, no one's ever asked us that question before. Sure, there's no prohibition against it, so we can do it. So I said, okay, great, this is what we're gonna do. You're all gonna bid out WAN access circuits from your school buildings to my building, all of you, 67 buildings. And then you're going to aggregate your transit purchase together at that point, that's a media room. And then I can attract wholesale transit providers to it. So, the average price per meg that these 15 school districts are paying is $3.86. I got them 35 cents a meg. So of course now the governor wants me to build more of these. She wants, and I, when I met with her, I said, listen, I'm just gonna do this. I'm not asking you for anything. I don't need subsidies or grants or anything. And when it happens, you can come to the ribbon cutting and take all the credit. And then, now that's why she wants one in Des Moines and one in Des Moines. <laughs> that is exactly the reaction that's going to occur in every single state. So that's, that's not the problem. The problem is uh, demand management, I call it. So on the website that I set up for this business, I have an application form. And if you have this problem and you're interested and you're willing, you should apply. I spoke with Lou about this yesterday, and we'll figure out how to get this out to the broader community through Connected Nation, ICF, et cetera. Because as I've learned, um, a lot of these communities have people in them who are responsible for looking after the well-being of the people in the community, the students, but yet they are the ones that are profiting from the problem. They actually want me to come and tell them everything about what I'm gonna do so that they can figure out how to subvert it I am not interested in spending any of my time or capital in any of those places. So the willing must present themselves and then I will review the application to determine whether or not it meets the minimum threshold for deployment, which there's a whole formula or recipe for that, which I won't get into. It's not that complicated, but I think you get the point. There's a minimum number of subscribers that I need to have access to in order to attract the content providers to come. And I know what that is, um, it's roughly 20,000 subscribers, and that generates five gigs worth of traffic, and Google and Akamai will come, and Verisign will come, and then I can get the rest. It just happens from there. So anyway, I just wanted to explain that, um, generically speaking, I can't solve all the problems. This solution applies to everyone, anywhere. So if you want to build your own facility and try to operate it, as Westerville's doing, and I applaud them for that, I just encourage them to look out for uh, protection of that in, in perpetuity because at some point administrations change and someone will come along and be offered a hefty sum from an incumbent or a private equity firm to sell it and they will and then the rules will change and it will all go away so don't do that thank you <laughs> thank you uh
Great. I, I think this really points to the importance of the middle mile and competitive uh, uh, pricing on bandwidth. You've been involved in several of those types of projects. Can you talk about how those have worked, different collaborations? Well, there, yeah, there's been a lot of them. I mean, the middle mile is a, is a big problem. It gets to, you know, connecting into a community, and then it, it's basically the solution uh, Hunter's been talking about. Uh, it, it, it is something that is, requires the infrastructure, I guess the way to put it. I'm very, uh, very prejudiced towards infrastructure deployment, because once you have it, you've got it. And maybe it won't work the first time in, the, you know, in a financial way that you want it to, but it's there and will ultimately be used. So a lot of the VTOP deployments, some have gone well and some haven't, but in any event, the infrastructure's out there. There's a lot more infrastructure today in southeastern Ohio than there was before. And this, I think, gets to yet another point, which is there is no silver bullet here for rural areas. Uh, you, you, you're going to have to make incremental improvements using various technologies and various ways to subsidize, uh, perhaps getting a middle mile, perhaps getting a, uh, a neutral access point. Uh, there are things you need to do. And, and, and a final point is there's rural and there's rural. Uh, I think he's been talking about uh, basically smaller towns and municipalities. Uh, and then there's the folks even more desperate, in fact, much more desperate on the other side of that, uh, who have, uh, you know, they're, they're miles from a small town. They may be a mile uh, or two from their nearest neighbor. Uh, and those people are depopulating like crazy. So the middle mile is part of the solution. And it is, it is certainly something that needs to be deployed so we can bring internet access, or as, as one of my clients calls it, bring the fire hydrant closer. Uh, and and uh, that will do that, but there still needs to be last mile or a way to connect to those people, especially the ones that are in the very rural areas. Eric, you have Yeah, um, you know, Greg makes a really good point. I guess, again, I would suggest that if you're a government official and you're looking to invest in infrastructure, you focus on the type of infrastructure that Hunter and Greg have talked about um, versus actually trying to go out and become a uh, broadband provider. Um, you know, again, it's a question of the biggest bang for your buck. Um, you're going to need the middle mile infrastructure. You're going to need the aggregation um, to facilitate last mile broadband service. So again, um, and, and, the, and the hope is that if you, put, you get these facilities built, um, that you can make them available on a non-discriminatory basis to anyone. You know, um, and uh, as a way of letting all flowers bloom, so to speak. Um, in addition, you know, again, if you're government, you want to make sure that you invest some money in digital literacy and um, you know the softer stuff um, to help people manage uh, uh, participation on the internet, um, especially in rural communities that aren't as familiar. Um, there are a lot of people, especially senior citizens, and, you know, who just, um, you know, haven't done it. Um, so um, I think you, you have to make those types of investments too, and it, it, it's, you know, it's appropriate for governments to make, make those types of investments as well as the uh, infrastructure investment. Thanks. There's a couple questions that are related from the audience. and is servicing fiber connectivity in indigenous communities the same as any other rural community and then the uh, second part of that question is how do the issues in the countryside mirror those faced by poor urban communities we were talking about uh, cleveland earlier at lunch today um, all right you want to well let me just make a point about indigenous communities that's a really good in the u.s and i'm and i um, apologize that my um discussion has been mainly U.S. centric here. Um, for many years, um, you know, um, even basic, providing basic telephone service on tribal lands in the U.S. has been a challenge. I mean, even today, uh, many uh, tribal lands um, don't have reliable basic telephone service. Getting broadband to um, indigenous uh, lands is even, has been even more challenging not just because many of these areas are have a very de uh, are not densely populated at all, sparsely populated, um, but there are also topography challenges, and then just the um, amount of income that the average 
you know, um, consumer on, on many of these lands have makes it a challenge. So um, in the U.S., we've uh, taken many approaches. We make money available through the universal service programs to tribal lands. Um, but we also did something. When I was at the FCC 20 years ago, um, we created a program that incentivizes wireless carriers to um, deploy facilities on tribal lands. You get a bidding credit regardless of how much money you have, how many, much revenue. AT&T could get this credit. If AT&T decided, a company as big as AT&T, if they decided they wanted to provide service on the White Mountain Apache Reservation in New Mexico, they would get a bidding credit that would equal, depending on how much that would uh, be related to the amount of land area they would be covering. Uh, it's a very attractive credit. And unfortunately, because uh, that most of these uh, tribal lands are spark sparsely populated, many of the big carriers don't really go after the credit. But there is a, a credit that's available every time there is a, an auction at the FCC of Spectrum. There is a credit made available for tribal lands, specific to tribal lands, and it's the only credit that's made available based on area of land mass covered. And there is also a separate bidding credit available for rural. If you are if you are interested in acquiring spectrum licenses to cover a rural area, you can get a credit up to they capped it unfortunately at ten million dollars per um, applicant, but you can get a credit towards the purchase of that license. Now again, you have to purchase the license. These are, this is for um, spectrum licenses that are auctioned, um, so you do have to go through the process of actually purchasing the spectrum license, but um, whereas you wouldn't have to do that if you were using TV white spaces, because we didn't tell you, we didn't mention this, but the spectrum there is free. You don't have to pay for it. It's unlicensed, what they call unlicensed. But you know, if you want to, to use uh, interference protected spectrum to provide broadband services, that is another good option, especially if you want to do it on reservations or in areas that are designated rural. A couple questions uh, about Hunter's comments. Uh, uh, first one, Hunter's idea is great. Why are there not more of these? And then second, there's a question from people in small communities about uh, you know, twenty. You'd have to go uh, several hundred miles maybe to get your twenty thousand customers. So what about the smaller communities? What's uh, you may is it worth it for a community to invest in that kind of facility, even you know with their own dollars to subsidize that kind of uh, facility uh, to bring that low cost connectivity? Clearly, if a business is seeking a location, they'd rather pay thirty cents. A meg for internet than uh, thirty dollars a meg for their connectivity. What do you think about an approach for smaller communities? Okay, so um, I'll take questions in order. Um, how come there aren't more of these? I remember when I started Telex with a couple of guys here in New York at Sixty Hudson Street. No one had ever heard of network neutral interconnection. We couldn't raise any money. We said we we're in the co-location business. People thought we were in the moving business. <laughs> that is now a multi-billion dollar global industry center. People refer to it generally as data center or interconnection data center. But companies like Equinix and Digital Realty that you know, I knew the founders of, I was one of the founders of Telex. I did a deal to take over Digital Realty's meeting rooms back in 2006. They acquired Telex for $1.9 billion. Um, that, the same question, I sort of was asked that question, I guess around 2003, four, five. It's like, this is great, this is a great idea. Why aren't there more of these? Time and place, evolution. It just had not happened yet. I can give you a whole magical mystery through our history of the consent decree in 84. Uh, the actual physical interconnection that McGowan did with MCI at 60 Street, 1986. Fast forward to the Rochester Telephone Building down from upstate New York, connecting through 60 Hudson to 32 A of A to get to the deregulated long distance. 
the consent decree was a piece of paper. It didn't happen until it physically happened. And it physically happened at 60 Hudson Street. I came into 60 Hudson Street in 1996, 7, 8, started Telex. 98, we were at 214. We changed to uh, real estate holding business in the year 2000. I actually conceived of the very first direct interconnect with Quest while I was in Dublin, Ohio, at the LCI campus there, which they had just acquired. And I whiteboarded it for these Quest guys. And that became the genesis of a company called Questlink, which was basically Quest extending their demarcation points into media rooms like mine in the carrier hotels in the US, which at the time I was the only person that knew where they were. I wrote articles about these buildings. It's all pretty well known. By now. Um, so the next frontier is the North Liberty Iowa, you know, the tier end. And that's not so obvious because where I'm putting this building, presently there's, there's nothing. <laughs> there's a tower. And the Iowa City School District is building an elementary school. Um, so I often thought about Genesis and how it starts. And most character hotels in the US are former Western Union buildings because of the pneumatic tube infrastructure and rights of way that were established well back you know, to the time of the Civil War. It's all about control and rights of way and access, period. Um, the other buildings were Macy's buildings, um, same thing, pneumatic tubes, um, hamburgers, um, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing, um, or buildings that had just good physical infrastructure, uh, power infrastructure, but every single carrier hotel had a story. And every time I went to one, um, I would always look for the guy that I called the Lorax, uh, which is actually a little bit of a trick because it's the one slur, but I called it the name of the book. And I would find a guy who was like the building engineer, building manager. That was the guy that was there from the beginning who could tell you where everything was and why. When you learn the story, it was that, well, this building was across the street from the Bell Central Office, or this building was X or Y or Z, it was on the long haul fiber route or whatever. Those are all sort of done now. They're capped. They've been acquired, for the most part. There's still a few stragglers out there that I intend to acquire at some point. But um, the rest have been amalgamated by Telex, Digital Realty, Equinix Centrality, which is another company I'm, I started or partnering. Um, so it's coming. It will happen. What I'm trying to do is now, at the appropriate time, which is now, share this with everyone um, and deploy it at scale. So let's just say we're going to solve a problem over the next five years. I'd like everyone to apply now, and I'll organize everything and make it all tidy and orderly, and we will solve the problem one place at a time. Now, to the second question about rural, like rural and then there's rural. In one minute. I can't do that. Um, demand has to be aggregated to a point, and if I don't have the population density ratio, that's my minimum threshold for deployment. So those places are still on the outskirts and they need to find their way to a point. But I'm making it easier by bringing more points out there so that they don't have to find their way from the middle of the country to Chicago or Dallas. Now they can get to some place you know, reasonably closer, which then shortens the distance that that bill needs to occur, reducing capex, improving the ROI measures. Okay. Thanks. Greg, any closing comments for the group? Uh, just that there's no silver bullet. I tell everybody that you need to work on the edges on this and make incremental improvement. And that's, that's the way it's, I think, always going to be in rural, uh, uh, rural America, because uh, you don't have the density that will attract the most capital. Uh, so you just got to keep working at it and coming up with new solutions. Larry, anything? Yeah, I'm going to just, the word I will leave with you is be entrepreneurial, as entrepreneurial as you can. Uh, be familiar with these um, federal programs. Um, you will have to be creative about cobbling together federal, state support. Um, try to do everything you can to attract private um, investors. Uh, and that means taking a look at your uh, processes for approving right-of-way access, siting, whatever else you can do. Think about any other incentives that you can develop that will bring um, private uh, parties to to your communities, and um, you know it'll still be a challenge, but uh, uh, that's what you have to do. You have to try to be as entrepreneurial as you can. I'd encourage. In Minnesota, we're lucky enough to have a program called Border to Border Broadband <laughs> that has had twenty to thirty-five million to, uh, dollars per year uh, in that program over the last five years. 
been a great way to help subsidize the last mile uh, development. And uh, thinking about rural communities, the idea that, oh, well, we hope we can get 25 meg while everyone else in the world is using a gigabit. You know, you need, can't undersell your own community needs for broadband. So I encourage you to uh, set your sights high and uh, to find the resources to make that happen. We've even had rural townships in Minnesota now bond to help subsidize um, uh, that last mile deployment. So rural townships are getting fiber to home. We've been in partnership with companies like CenturyLink. So if people want this in their homes, uh, people want it in their home businesses, to do everything that we talk about in intelligent community, knowledge, workforce, entrepreneurship, innovation. So uh, aim high and set your vision and go for that. Thank you to our panel.